Good morning, everyone. For those, who, for those of you who haven't had the good fortune of meeting, I'm Drew Castretano, and I have the privilege of working with your grandchildren and your children as Millbrook's headmaster. Uh, my longtime colleague, Bob Anthony, who was in the back, uh, coined Grandparents' Day the happiest day in the school year. It is. Uh, and as if on cue, the sun has come out. So uh, we are thrilled to see you. This is a great turn. Just come on in and sit down. Now, if you were your grandchildren, you would get a real scowl from me. Um, how, you went to a class, I understand that. How'd you do? Okay. I'll come back to you. I want to give you a quick update on school, tell you a little bit about this place where you are, and then actually what I really want to talk about are your children, not your grandchildren. Um, we've had an outstanding start to the school year. Uh, we are uh, very full as a school. We're fortunate that our admissions are outstanding. Um, we're supposed to be a school of 310. We're more like a school of 320, uh, but we figured that all out. Um, and the energy is terrific, uh, the attitude is great, and so we're off. We're off uh, for Millbrook. We've been a little wet, like all of you. It's been a little soggy, but it's all good. It's all good. Um, we, some of you may know that we finished last December an $80 million capital campaign, and of that, about $50 million went into the physical plant, and so you're seeing a lot of bright and shiny new things. Uh, with a few more to come, and then the rest went into the endowment. It was supposed to be a $60 million campaign, and we zoomed by that number. Uh, thanks in large part to our leadership donors and our trustees who are so devoted to the school. Um, so it's great. We're, we're, uh, we're excited about all of that, and we're already thinking about the next thing, or the next things. Um, more on that another time. Maybe more on that next Grandparents' Day. Let me tell you a bit about where you are. This is the Flag of Memorial Chapel. Cam Hardy, our chaplain, just walked in with her mother. Cam, wave again. Cam's back there. Cam's office is right there. Um, there are two things that distinguish Millbrook School. Well, the first thing that distinguishes Millbrook School is our mission. That is the reason why your grandchildren are here. In a community where every student is known and needed, Millbrook School prepares its graduates for lives of meaning for college and lives of meaning and consequence by instilling the values of respect, integrity, stewardship, service, and curiosity. So if you're wondering why your grandchildren are here, that's why. Um, and that's what we do. And one of the ways we make sure that every student is known is we meet as a school four times a week. On Monday morning, it's here. I saw some of you peering at these pew cards. So at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, your grandchildren come rushing in and they find where they're supposed to sit. The seniors are up in the balcony and the prefects of the month are there. There are usually a bunch of kids up here have to make announcements. And so that's announcements usually. Then Tuesday, we have seated lunch with advisors. Each of us have advisees. No one has more than six advisees. Um, I'm an advisor. Uh, and uh, then Thursday night, the students dress up and they come in here quietly, very different than when they come in for assembly, quietly. Again, the prefects, we have 12 prefects, six senior, six senior boys, six senior girls, elected by their peers to uh, really run the school. And so they're helping to keep it quiet. There often is some music, and then a student usually gives a homily. We call them chapel talks. Uh, <clears throat> and that uh, takes 10, 15 minutes, and then we file out to the dining hall where we have seated dinner. And then after that, there's actually senior faculty coffee. And then Fridays, we're here at 10, for what we call temperature check. It starts with announcements. And again, to make an announcement, you, the prefects send out an email. You have to respond by 10 p.m. 
the day before, and you have to tell them what your announcement is about. The faculty have been told, we don't make many announcements. This is really you know, developing the responsibility and the needed part of the community, teaching kids real responsibility, teaching them how to speak publicly. Uh, and they do announcements, and then they go to concerns with recommendations, stories of value to the community, and lastly, we end on appreciations. <clears throat> and that's what we do every Friday. So we're here, and that's how, one, of the, one of the ways that we make sure that our students are known and needed. I was told this morning, by the way, that the cookie jar in my office is full, which means that I'm supposed to know every student's name by now. Because if I don't, then they get a cookie. I think I got a little work to do, but I'll get there. So good. Let's talk about your children. Um, so I'm a grandparent. I'm, I'm a not, I don't get to go to Grandparents' Day yet, but um, uh, I have a three-year-old grandson, and that grandson has a four-month-old sister. So that's our middle son, and our oldest son and his wife have a, have a six-year-old, uh, six-month-old boy. So I'm with you, right? I'm with you. I'm feeling the good vibe. This generation, I'm worried, actually worried, I, I feel for this generation of parents. Because there are two realities that are far different than they were for you and even for me and my wife Linda. The first is this, that big business has figured out that it sells a lot of stuff if you keep parents scared. If you keep parents anxious and scared, it sells a lot of products. It sells really expensive car seats. I'm amazed that when I'm carrying my you know, grandchildren around in these car seats that weigh about 50 pounds, and they can't get out of until they're 10, um, <laughs> or they weigh 107 pounds, right? Um, it sells a lot of somewhat unnecessary services, some tutoring early on, some enrichment programs. It sells a lot of medication. You know, Big Pharma has figured out that if you tell people that the answer to their problems is in a pill at age eight, that that's a good thing. The number of our students who come here and say, I'm done, I don't want to take my medication, I don't want to take Ritalin or Adderall or Concerta anymore, can you help us, me do that? And in fact, we can. So your children are overly anxious because their children, your grandchildren, are by every statistical measure the safest and healthiest group of human beings in the history of humankind. The world remains, the world always has been, the world remains a dangerous place, a challenging place, a difficult place. But your children's anxiety gets in the way of their children's learning the skills that they need to learn to manage all those things. Resilience, optimism, perseverance, empathy. So, I'm here to ask for your help. One of the things I say to parents regularly is, the best thing they can say to their own children, again, your grandchildren, is, it'll work out. It's going to be okay. <clears throat> and I don't, you know, that's been lost because they're, frankly, they don't believe that it's going to be okay. So the second reason that you need to, and we need to show some empathy and help, help your children, it, oh, I didn't bring it with me, is because of uh, smartphones. So when something went wrong, I was fortunate enough to go to boarding school. My parents never went to college, and I got lucky, and I went off. When something went wrong, I had no ability to tell them that anything went wrong. I think there was one phone on the entire campus, right? And that was a bad thing. That, that wasn't good, because that really kept the distance, which we don't think is a good thing. We want to partner with parents. But I didn't tell them. They didn't know. 
Now, when something goes wrong in one of your grandchildren's lives, their parents know about it instantly because they get a text. They get a text. This is a burden. This is a challenge. It requires a new set of parenting skills because what do you do with that? I just failed my math test. I feel so awful. Um, blah, 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 blah. And of course, any good parent is going to want to engage with that. I'm so sorry. You do that. Then the next thing goes wrong. Again, you have another conversation. A friend does something mean and insensitive. You go down there. Student doesn't get the part in the play that she wants. You go down, you do that. So this is happening now every day and maybe multiple times a day. And it's a trap. It's a dangerous trap when you go down what our Dean of Students, Dan Skogan, calls the rabbit hole. And you engage, this generation of parents engages with their children's emotions more than any generation. Doesn't mean you're not aware of them, you're not sensitive to them, but they engage, that's different. They start dealing with it. And one of the things that happens is they start blaming, they, they agree with the students blaming other people for when things don't go the way they should. That teacher's so unfair. Clearly, the coach didn't see your potential. That, that takes away the responsibility from the student. It also robs the student of confidence. Yeah, it's too bad. I can understand you're disappointed. Why don't you take a couple days, go talk to your advisor. Why don't you take a couple days to think about your plan? What are you gonna do? I'm sure you can figure this out. I'm sure it will work out. So, your kids, in some ways, have got it tough. They do, because they, uh, they are being challenged in the way that, or in different ways, certainly other generations of parents have been challenged in some profound ways, but this generation is being challenged in different ways. Uh, your grandchildren are known as the iGen, do you know that? Right, they're the iGen because they have never known life without an iPhone, ever. Our three kids are 35, 33, and 28. The 35-year-old still calls on a landline, which actually annoys me because I don't even know where that phone is. <laughs> and the one upstairs doesn't work, right? Because who does that? The 33-year-old emails, and calls on the cell phone. The 28-year-old, nothing but texts, right? I, and he says, well, we talked earlier in the week. That's not talking. <laughs> we texted. Um, so these are the things that, and, and in response to this, we have grown. Barbara Gatsky, where are you? Barbara's right there. So everybody look at Barbara, Barbara wave. So. Again, I don't know how many of you remember your high school years in this way, but I don't think when you were in high school, when I was in high school, there was something called the Director of Parent Programs, and whose uh, job description includes, as a major portion, parent education, helping our parents to work with us more effectively through a variety of programs, including this coming Parents Weekend, when the country's leading authority on boys and teenage development, Michael Thompson, is going to come and spend time. You may know Michael if you uh, ever read his book, uh, Raising Cain, Protecting the Emotional Life of Boys. So Michael's going to come and we're going to spend time educating parents. Uh, and so the scope of our curriculum has grown pretty substantially. I'm happy to answer a couple questions. I hope that's a helpful update as you know what's on our mind and what we do here. I happen to answer a question or two, and then Betty, when are we off? We've got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, so is there a question or two? You're recording what you just said. What we do is recording. Very good, thank you, because I should have said that. So the question is, what do we do with the recordings? We have a fabulous website, and almost everything that happens here of significance is on the website. So those chapel talks that I mentioned earlier, on the website. 
under uh, Millbrook in Motion. Alex Pearson, who's taping me right now, is the person who makes that all happen. If, if you want to know what's going on, go to the website. It's all there. It's either in photos or videos or, or news releases. So that's, that's where it goes. A great question. Uh, so that was, how do we control the use of cell phones? Uh, yes, we do try. And as John Downs, our assistant head for advancement, uh, coined the phrase, we are at the intersection of, John? Education and legislation. <laughs> so we, we're, we're, our real goal is to edu educate for appropriate use, but we also legislate. We say, you can't do this, you can't do that. So this is a cell-free zone. When you walk in the chapel, no, for, for, an, for a school, for a required event, no phone. Formal dinner, no phone. Um, and so one of the things that's changed, that again, picture, the place is jammed, the faculty's alone, the kids are here. Until this year, a student would stand up and make a two-minute announcement staring at this little box. And so we've ended that. Announcements are a lot better. Speakers are engaging with their audience. Uh, we also did a significant study and we found, and it'll be interesting to see how rapidly this changes. Our fifth and sixth formers, our 11th and 12th graders, do actually use their phones for academic purposes. The third and fourth formers, the ninth and 10th graders, never. It is purely for social activity. So the third and fourth formers put their phones in what look like little shoe holders that hang in the dorm and their room number is on it. So when they walk into study hall at five of eight, they take their phone and they put it where it goes. In the upper class, they can do that. Upper class dorms, they can do it as well. But it is required for third and fourth formers. And then, so that's the legislation part. The education part is just a lot of conversation um, about the, the, and a lot of education about the, 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 the downsides of social media and being able to post something the minute you feel it or see it. Sadly, we had a dismiss a boy um, the day before school started um, uh, because of something he posted in response to nothing that happened here at school. And it was a disappointment for him and a hard moment for him but then he made it known to a lot of people in a way that was really uh, inappropriate for a Millbrook student. And fortunately, his peers saw it and brought it to us. And we had a conversation and he indeed did, did it. So that's a form of education, a tough, that's a tough form of education. Did you discontinue the football program? Say it again. Did you discontinue the football program? Did we discontinue the football program? we've actually added the football program. So, the, uh, well we don't, football doesn't play on Wednesdays. So they play, uh, they have their first game down in New Jersey later uh, on Saturday. So Millbrook uh, did away with football in the, I think the last team was 1977. Uh, and three years ago, we started with a group of other schools, eight player football. So uh, there are obviously eight, players on a side. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a somewhat different game. And, and it's interesting, schools are joining us. There were four of us originally, now there are six, and there are two more who want to do it next year. So this seems to be a, a good thing. We, we are trying that. So the question is, can we have all the sporting events here? Athletic scheduling is more complicated than the meetings going on at the UN today. Um, uh, it, it really is. And you have to do it five years in advance, but we try to do that. And it would be great if we can. And if we can do anything to assist you in getting to the away games, if you need directions or you need help, let us know. Let Barbara know and we can get you directions. But that's a great suggestion and it's something we're gonna to try to do. But it, I will say it's hard. Yep. Uh, I noticed you were using technology in the classrooms. How do you deliver your curriculum? Because I do that in my company. 
it's virtual, it's, it's a variety of methods. How are, we, how are you doing that with your students as opposed to just instruct their students? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, basically, what's the, what's the method of teaching? What's our pedagogy? Um, and it, as you suggest by your very good question, it's, it's in multiple modalities. So what it is, it's a student-centered classroom first and foremost, where we meet students where they are. Our, we have some honors classes that may have 18 or 19 students, but the average class size is 13. Um, and so they're very small classes. Again, every student is known. Uh, so there will be, and look at classrooms, um, and you'll see the furniture is designed in different ways. So there'll be stools often around. So there is essentially no lecture. Um, it, it would be uh, the Socratic method sometimes, so class conversation, um, the Harkness method where it's going back and forth. There'll be a lot of group work. Um, there'll be a lot of student presentation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in the sciences, it's even more sophisticated with that, with some mathematical approaches, some narrative approaches to solve the same problem. So it requires a level of sophistication on the part of the faculty and a level of professional development on the school's part to support that that's substantial. Um, in terms of technology, everything, the students can get everything, all their assignments, they submit all their assignments either online or through our website. They can get in the back end of the website. Mark? Of, all, of all the recent revelations uh, among, from um, private schools to St. Paul's and other schools, how have they impacted your job? So the question is, uh, the very sad and troubling revelations of sexual abuse and sexual misconduct among, at boarding schools and actually across, it seems, all. I, I, I listened this morning to nothing but Bill Cosby um, and Brian Kavanaugh or Brett Kavanaugh, Brett. Um, I think those revelations have affected my job significantly uh, and affected how we do things. We have, uh, we do boundaries education now uh, in really important ways. And we've changed the way we behave. So here's a good example. My, one of my senior advisees is a girl. She texted me and said, uh, I need, I wanna, she was deciding on a course change uh, my wife was away. I was in Polling House, the head's house, alone. She said, I'll come over at 8 o'clock at night. I said, no, I'll meet you in your dorm. All right, so our behaviors have had to change significantly. Um, the safety and the well-being of our students is our top priority to the point where it's multiple levels above everything else. So we educate we do terrific boundaries training. We talk about scenarios, how we'll handle things. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's changed, I think, in really healthy ways how we behave. Um, fortunately, all those reports are from mostly the 80s and earlier. So, uh, and we had a case here uh, in 1982. Um, we dealt with it. We did a comprehensive uh, investigation about every year of the school's existence and, and uh, have, have handled it and it appears that the situation is open and closed. I'm actually uh, proud, I would say, that the graduate who came forward um, is now a good friend and comes to alumni events. So I consider that a, a success for her and for the school. Okay, I think you have to move on. It's great to see you. Thank you very much for coming. We love it. <laughs>